So I'm so glad that we have such a good turnout. It looks like a lot of folks um, are signing in to learn more about the Pre-K for Me curriculum, which was written by the Maine Department of Education in partnership with Boston Public Schools, as well as some contracted teachers um, and coaches within Maine. Some of you I know are already using Pre-K for Me, so please, please, please add to this conversation. If I've missed something, or if you have experience in your classroom that you think is important to shout out, please interrupt me and do that. Do not wait for me to call on you. Um, and many of you I know have been using or are familiar with the OWL curriculum. You'll see a lot of connections between the two. A lot of the components of the curriculum are similar um, or derived directly from OWL. So we'll get uh, more into that as well. So I'm gonna share my screen with you to show you where you can find the curriculum on our website. So you should all be seeing the main.gov slash DOE homepage. Very red right now for the coronavirus updates and resources. Um, typically that's not there, it's just blue. But once you're on our homepage, you'll see this teaching and learning tab. And this will bring you to um, a, a variety of different resources, but the one you're gonna want is the early childhood education one. So once you're here, you'll notice on the left-hand side, there's a variety of other tabs that will bring you to different resources. The one we want for the curriculum is Pre-K for Me. <clears throat> of course, we had to use the ME acronym for Maine because everything in Maine is ME. I guess it's an acronym, it's uh, initials, abbreviation. So here's where you'll find everything you'll need to implement the curriculum in your programs. There's six units, and I apologize, on my home Google Chrome, um, it shows up all wonky like this, when I'm at my desk, it looks very neat and symmetrical. Um, so it's a little frustrating that it shows up like this. I'm not sure if our tech guy can do something about that, but bear in mind that the six units are below at the bottom of the page. Unit six, things that grow, is not up yet. I'm still working on it on my end. It's completed. Um, it's just still in my hands to get the um, links all tied together and posted. Um, I'm not in as big of a time crunch now with some of the pre-K closures for the pandemic, um, but it is still obviously a priority of mine to get that up and going. So the picture, things that grow, is here, and eventually you'll just be able to click on the picture and it'll bring you to unit-specific materials. But that's a dead link right now. All the others, however, um, are alive. But before I get too deep into that, I wanted to give you some information as far as navigating this home site. So in the beginning, you'll just see um, a brief description of how Pre-K for Me came to be. And the short story of that is when Chapter 124 went into effect in July of 2017, it brought to the surface a lot of concerns from districts from around the state in regards to the section referring to um, implementing an evidence-based curriculum. So there's a variety of different curriculum that pre-K programs can be using that are evidence-based. They all come with a price tag. So that concern was loud and clear from districts that, you know, we're happy to implement to be in compliance with 124. However, we didn't budget for this curriculum or we want to use this curriculum, but it's out of budget. So we've refer deferred back to a, uh, low cost curriculum that we're not really pleased with. We've heard a lot of different stories. So that doesn't settle well with us, of course, and at the department, we can't tell you what curriculum to use. It's entirely up to the local school districts to make that decision based on their community, their teachers, their students, and what they feel is best in terms of alignment to other grades, um, and what they feel is best for their students and for their teachers. Um, so all we can do with the department is simply recommend or guide you to where you can find quality in curricula, um, but the final decision is up to districts. So with that in mind, with the budget crisis and the cost of quality programs um, being an issue, 
we were lucky enough to utilize some federal grant money that was received through um, a project that was a five-year project. It was called the Preschool Expansion Grant. And we had some funding in there to uh, contract with Boston because Boston Public Schools had already done this. And it's interesting because when I think of Boston, I think of like a statewide um, numbers because the number of students that Boston Public Schools is serving is close, if not a little more than what we serve in Maine statewide. But Boston is just Boston. It's just part of the Massachusetts school district or um, department of ed. So this little unit, it's almost similar to like if we were saying Portland Public Schools, right? That's just a part of the Department of Education. It's just a part of uh, our statewide efforts in education. Similar to Boston, they're just a chunk of the state, but they're a very large chunk. So Boston had took it, taken OWL. Somehow they got the rights to rewrite it, and that's what they did. They made the OWL curriculum more um, appropriate for students who are living and learning in Boston. So they added a lot of urban and city-based pieces to the curriculum because that's what their students and that's what their families experience day in and day out. That is not applicable to all of our communities in Maine. So we took and contracted with Boston to rewrite their curriculum, which is called Focus on K-1. We rewrote Focus on K-1 to be more applicable in Maine. So much more rural, um, talk about the lobstering in industry, fishing industries, lakes, uh, mountains, ocean, coastline, you name it. Because that's what our families and our children experience. So that's just a little backstory of how it came to be. You'll see on the right hand side of this site um, the specific accolades for those who contributed directly. So Melissa Luke is from Boston. She now lives and works out of California. We still have um, great contact with her. She's a fantastic um, resource for us. And I'm gonna try and keep up with the chat box, but forgive me. Marcy, maybe if something comes up in the chat box, will you just shout out for me if it's um, applicable? I can do that. Awesome, thank you. Because I struggle to do more than one thing at once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> goes on. Oh. So then within Maine, we had Kelly Fran, um, Dr. Beth Hatcher, um, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Carno, um, and some of you might know Annika McIsaac. They all live and work in Maine and provided some really great in, uh, information and rewrites for us here. Last school year, 1819, we had, I believe, 13 school districts pilot the program. So many of those teachers are the ones I referenced earlier that are present on the call today. So they're gonna be able to um, let you know their specific feedback and experiences with it. And then we were able to post it online throughout the summer and throughout the school year. So here we are now. And uh, many of those piloting teachers, as well as some additional new ones are, or were using the curriculum um, currently this year. So the first thing I recommend is that if you are considering using this in your classrooms, is to first access here, the Pre-K for Me curriculum guiding documents. This is gonna bring you to, um, it's sort of a booklet if you were to print it out, which anybody who wants to print it certainly can. You'll see it's about 89 pages long. And this just gives you some really good information around um, the components of the curriculum. So I keep saying that, components. The components is what a teacher does in her, his or her classroom on a daily basis with their students. So it's basically how the schedule is worked out during the day. So it's gonna cover um, the main part of the curriculum, which is read alouds. Every unit has really specific read alouds and a really specific intent behind how you do those read alouds. It's not just, um, you know, from 10 to 10, 15 is our whole group read aloud time. I'm gonna pick a book that is randomly or essentially random um, and read it and have a conversation with my students about it. It's much more than that. It's much more intentional than that. So the read alouds within the curriculum are there for a reason. They should all be available through the main library system um, or if you prefer to purchase them through Amazon or another book website, um, they should all be current and in print. So you shouldn't have any trouble with that. 
Nicole, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Um, Gail asked a question. She wanted to know, is it your hope that all schools pre-Ks use this curriculum? So that's a great question. Not necessarily, Gail. It's just an option that the Department of Education wanted to provide to schools as a choice. And it's a free choice. And I say free kind of like this because you would need to purchase the specific materials needed for the curriculum. With that said, the materials are not such that a, a high quality program wouldn't already have them anyway. Um, but there are some that a, a classroom may not have like specific baby dolls or um, specific uh, water um, center containers, things like that. A lot of the materials also could be um, recycled or reused or donated at a low or no cost. Um, so no, every pre-K programs do not have to use this. It's just an option um, to sort of supplement some of the um, budgeting crises that we were hearing from districts as far as the cost of other curricula and the cost of PD for other curricula as well. So thanks for asking that. So another component outside of the read alouds would be intro to centers and centers. This is another huge chunk of your time during the day, very intentional. Again, it's not just about having a block center, having a dramatic play, having a water table. It's having those centers with really specific materials and guidance around how children should be um, encouraged to use those materials. And you'll see over time how those change throughout the units as well as how they connect directly back to the read aloud stories. Thinking and feedback is another component. This is a time when uh, the other day one teacher described it as show and tell on steroids, which made me chuckle because it sort of is like a show and tell on steroids. But the difference being it's not the student bringing something in from home to show and tell. It's about the teacher noticing an activity or an art project or a conversation or a thought that a child is having during centers and then interacting with that student around, hey, I noticed you were writing a letter um, to your uh, child care provider, Miss Sue, whatever. I, saw, I noticed you were writing a letter to Miss Sue. Tell me more about that and having that back and forth with the child and then saying, I think this is something that your other friends would like to learn more about, would you be willing to share it with them? So then in the thinking and feedback component is during a whole group um, with that student's permission, you highlight the work that the child was working on and then the peers have a chance to ask questions and provide feedback. So they might say, for example, why did you choose to write to Miss Sue? Or did you think about writing to um, Miss Donna, the bus driver, or whatever the case may be, and they ask questions and there's this give and take between that student's share and the peers asking and providing feedback. Um, this document will also give you a math overview. Um, we contracted with Jodell Austin from South Portland. She's a pre-K teacher in that district. And with uh, Dr. Hatcher, I believe. Um, and the two of them wrote in the math pieces for the curriculum. So a lot of schools will supplement with um, another math curriculum, like um, there's like building blocks or everyday math or whatever. You could still do that if you want to. You don't have to because, as I said, the math is already part of built into this curriculum. And it's called math for me. Um, another component is small groups which more or less speaks for itself. I'm not gonna to get too much into the weeds there. And then there's songs, word plays, letters, and we also added numbers. So an acronym for this is SWPL, which we call SWIPL. So during SWIPL, um, this is another whole group activity. It doesn't take too long, but there's very intentional songs, poems, um, games, things like that with all the lesson plans are provided. Um, for teachers to be interacting with students during that time and having a real clear focus on these pieces. And then similarly, um, in Let's Find Out About It, this is another part where it's a whole group as well. Um, and the teacher is instructing the class on a very specific 
um, content, a very consistent concept. So for example, during Wind and Water, one of the Let's Find Out About It uh, lessons is around um, water absorbing and repelling, right? So we talk about sponges and an umbrella. We talk about um, like cloth sneakers and rain boots, right? And the difference between those materials that are absorbing water and repelling water. And it's a very specific lesson on that concept. We also wrote in um, some supplemental pieces around outdoor learning. So there's some um, ways that you could take the learning outside for every unit um, that has some really great examples. And then there's some sample schedules, a pacing calendar, and I'm gonna show you all these in just a minute. So as you scroll through the document, all of that's there. All of the explanations are there. I'm gonna interrupt one more time. There's a lot of chatter right now in the chat box about scheduling. And so um, we address that there is a half day schedule, sample and a full day. Um, but then there's a lady or a teacher who wants to know if there's a two day schedule. And I know that you'll cover this later on. So I just wanted everybody to know because I can't keep up with the typing that it will be covered later on. Um, and we will we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Marcy. You're welcome. So as you scroll through the guiding document, you'll see, I'm just trying to get to, okay. Um, for example, on this page nine, it gets into read alouds um, and what read alouds look like. So you'll notice there's read number one, which is the orientation reading. There's read number two, which would provide deeper vocabulary. And read number three, which is a reconstruction. And read number four, which is an acting out. So you might be wondering, what does that mean? So every story that's read aloud during read aloud time in each unit is read more than once throughout the week, not in the same day, but throughout the week. So if you start a story on Monday, and this, I'll show you where this is all lined out, but it'll say on the schedule, um, read number one. So this is where you could turn to, in addition to the lesson plan, to find out exactly what read number one is. So it says orientation, and you'll see that the text is just read through with minimal interruptions. So this is sort of your basic introduction. Welcome to story, or welcome to read aloud. Today we're gonna read Cry Baby by so-and-so, illustrated by so-and-so, and then you just read the story front to back, all fun, lovely. However, the second read aloud, you'll do that again, but the teacher's gonna be very intentional around what vocabulary words um, are highlighted throughout the text. And those words are given to you in the lesson plan. I'll show you where to find those. So you might, you're gonna be intentional as far as um, like your change of voice or maybe an action or some type of movement to highlight that word. And then you'll see, you can come here to see what read number three is and what read number four is. So there's gonna be another video, another time to really discuss read alouds specifically, so I'm not gonna go too much there. Just wanted to show you the type of information that you can find in the guiding documents link. And a quick tip, when you're in here and you wanna get back to the Pre-K For Me website, don't X out because that's gonna close everything. You've just gotta use the back button and it'll take you right back um, to the main page. So those are the guiding documents. So the next piece on the website is gonna show you around some additional resources. And like you said, there's the schedules, which I'm gonna open in just a second. And the other one that I really like is this suggested pacing calendar. So this is gonna pop up the school year. This is this current school year, so we'll need to update it for next year. But every unit is color coded to give you an idea of when you could implement each unit. So you'll notice that our suggestion is that you don't start unit one, week one, day one, until a few weeks after the school year has started. Typically schools are starting late August, beginning of September. So give the students a couple weeks, two, maybe even three weeks to get acclimated with riding the bus potentially, and just the transition into the school, your classroom, the materials, etc. So this is your time as the educator to just set the tone for the beginning of the school year before you start in with um, specific curriculum um, units. You'll also notice that in between, so you'll see unit one is red, unit two is yellow, and there's these two weeks in between. 
These blue weeks that show up once every couple months are what we call extension weeks. So this is the time for you as the teacher to extend, if you want, extend the unit an additional week. So if you think that your students are really into this topic, are really um, connecting with the materials and the lessons and you wanna give them another week to utilize that, perfect. It also provides you time if there's any hiccups in scheduling, snow days, holidays, um, a large absence for whatever reason, or sometimes there's um, whole school events that sort of mess with your daily schedule. So these other weeks are those days for like the makeup times. Um, so there's, those are there as well. There's also a great opportunity for you as the, the teacher to do a lesson or an activity that isn't necessarily part of pre-K for me, but is just something that you've always done with your class that you really enjoy. So like in October, we're gearing up for Halloween. So you might have a really great Halloween story and activity, dramatic play items, whatever it is. This is a perfect time to do that. So we don't want you to just forget about everything you've done in the past that you found um, engaging for students. We want you to still do that. There's time for that. Um, same thing around you know the holidays or in May around Mother's Day. Um, there's some really great activities that I know teachers love. So I want to encourage you to do those. There's also a blank one. So you that one I just showed you with colors is suggested. This blank one is one that you can print out on your end and highlight or color in and color code as you see fit. So you might not decide to start unit one until the last week of September or the beginning of October for whatever reason. Totally up to you. So that's something that you can have as a resource to um, color in on your own. So schedules. Our public pre-Ks in Maine are all over the map in terms of what their programming looks like. Many, and I use that term loosely, some programs operate full day, full week. So it sort of mirrors your K-12 time frame. Excuse me. Some operate half days. So let's roll down here. Um, and this varies as well. Some are half days, four days a week. Some are half days, five days a week. Um, some programs go full day, but it's only twice a week, like a Monday, Wednesday group, and then a Tuesday, Thursday group. Um, it's everywhere. So the full day schedule that you'll find here is really meant for that full day, full week. However, if you don't go the full five days, that's okay. It just means that the units are gonna take longer to complete for you. So you sort of need to be really mindful of that um, when planning. So a Monday through Friday, let me just show you real quick. Well, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to this. I'll show you in just a minute, sorry. Um, when you see the week scheduled, um, the layout of how the units play out in a week, you'll see that it's Monday through Friday. So it might mean though that you're, you don't have any children that come on Fridays or you might, or Mondays, whatever the case may be. So you sort of just need to shift that to make it fit your program and your hours that you provide. Um, there's no real easy answer aside from just us putting trust in you and identifying what days you do what. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that the whole program from day one in September to the last day in June follows a scope and sequence. So you can't just pick and choose ones you like, because if you pick week two, day three, and then you decide to do um, week one, day four after, that's not gonna make sense because they're, they're laid out in sequence purposely. So if you, have a, a, you don't have a Monday through Friday program, you go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then essentially you're not gonna do that Friday's activity, but that doesn't mean you should just skip it all together and start fresh on Monday the next week. It's gonna bump that Friday to the following Monday potentially. Does that make sense? Um, which is why I say the units could take longer. So it might just mean that you might do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, 
but on the schedule, it's sort of like a Monday. To, it's not easy. It's it's going to take a lot of thought um, and intention behind it. So, and I'm happy to guide you through that, you know, one on one or in a small training session um, if you're feeling really stuck with that, because it's doable. It's absolutely doable. It's just not as laid out on the website that way. So, one thing you'll notice between the full day schedule here and the half day schedule here the read alouds, and then this whole center chunk is what's predominant. Those are the two most important things. Day to day, whether you're half day, full day, full week, I don't care what it is, every day, read alouds, center, center time, is going to be part of your daily schedule. In a half day program, you'll find that you don't have time to implement all of the other components every day. So that's when you can be a little more flexible in terms of maybe doing Swipple on Monday, let's find out about it on Tuesday, small groups on Wednesday. You'll see here in the half day, it's not highlighting. Um, it kind of lays that out for you as a suggestion. So for example, Monday, you might implement whole group math. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, do small groups, Friday, storytelling and acting. That's something that you as the teacher need to um, decide the importance of and the amount of time you give it. But centers and read aloud are not optional in this curriculum. Can I interject also real quick that yes. the um, introduction to centers mm -hmm. and center time need to be back to back and together and one cannot be left off. So it's yes. kind of like the pre-teaching time, um, but it's very important to keep those two together so there's nothing in between them. Perfect, Marcy. I'm glad you said that. I didn't think of that. Um, these are one of those times where I think, well, that's obvious, <laughs> but it's probably not obvious. So yeah, she's exactly right. That intro to centers is a specific piece of the <laughs> curriculum followed up immediately by centers. Um, and again, the way we're doing this one hour discussion today, I have one scheduled next week. I get that idea. That will be um, specifically around intro to center. So next Wednesday, um, I have scheduled at from nine to ten. Will be intro to centers. I also have another one scheduled for read alouds. I have another one scheduled for swivel and math. Another one for thinking and feedback small group, and then another one for classroom environments. So those are the times when we're really going to dig into those specific components. Today is just about navigating the website and seeing what's available and what these links bring you to. Also, I should mention that all of these will be recorded and posted um, in a Google folder, which I'll share the link to on this page here. So it can be accessed at any time. You'll only get the one-hour certificate, though, for being here in person live, not for a recording. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the other additional curriculum resources is the visual book inventory for uh, units one through six. So when you're planning ahead for the school year, if this is something that you want to implement 100%, then this will give you an idea of what books you'll need ahead of time. Some classrooms will purchase or um, prepare to borrow all of the books at once. Others um, do it unit by unit. So these are just visuals of them. And you'll notice that a lot of them are familiar, good old fashioned stories that we grew up with, like Corduroy. Um, the Hello Goodbye Window is not necessarily an oldie, but definitely a goodie. I, my own family loves this book. We read it numerous times. Um, Ezra Jack Keats is a really popular and common author that I think many of us would be familiar with. Brown Bear, Brown Bear. Um, let's see. Dandelion, The Little Red Hen. I mean, these are books that I see in classrooms not utilizing pre-K for me. Um, and then, of course, there'll be some ones that you're not familiar with and you'll just need to take that time um, to read ahead of time so you're comfortable. Shape capers, actual size, um, some more Ezra Jack Keats, The Snowy Day, just really great literature with really great intentional activities um, to build on it. Snowflake Bentley, I think who doesn't love these books? Right? Some of them um, are also used in Owl and also used in Boston, um, and some of them are not. So, And the other one I'll bring your attention to is this material list. So again, in preparing 
Um, some teachers get it all up front. Some teachers plan it out as the units come to be. But this will bring you to a Google folder um, where you can see exactly what you're going to need for the unit. So unit one, for example. And hopefully you'll see and say, oh, I already have that. You know, my classroom is, has been using that for years. And that in some of them you'll see, for example, newspapers, right? Like, oh, I, we can get those um, when needed. That doesn't need to be purchased. Um, paint items, art items, tops from laundry detergent jugs, right? So these are recyclable items um, that you can start asking for or start collecting in your own home. Smocks, you don't have to buy those fancy Velcro rubbery smocks. You know, go through your husband's drawer. He won't miss them. <laughs> I'm sure there's old big t-shirts that you can throw in a bin for your kiddos to use as smocks. You don't need to be top of the line materials. It just needs to be appropriate, well-made, reusable items. So Nicole, there's a question that came in from Janice. She's wondering if there's data that compares student progress, parent and student satisfaction, readiness for kindergarten, et cetera, for schools now doing this program as compared to programs they have worked with in the past? Um, that's a good question. So that's not something that we at the DOE necessarily have. However, I would imagine that Boston um, potentially has data. So we have not researched pre-K for me in Maine yet. Um, that's definitely something we're wanting to do. Uh, but costs a lot of money. So it always comes down to funding. However, Boston has researched their focus on K-1 um, with really phenomenal outcomes. So I'm just going to pull up their website here and see if you can find a spot um, where it was done. So in essence, Pre-K for Me, as it sits right now, is not yet an evidence-based curriculum. It's still just a research-based curriculum, meaning that the components put within the curriculum are based on what we know is research um, best practice and, and shows um, high quality outcomes for stu student outcomes. So unless or until we have the curriculum specifically studied in Maine with our students over the course of a year or two, um, then it, it won't be evidence-based yet. Boston's K-1 curriculum, oh, here we go, is researched, is evidence-based. So whatever um, level of outcomes that they received when doing their research, could be translated to pre-k for me because the similarities are strong um, so are you guys following me on here i'm kind of trying to talk and show it so this um, is their research the impacts of boston public schools k-1 on children's early numeracy language literacy executive functioning functioning and emotional development so this is something that you could um, access for free and share with administration um, read for yourself for your own background and I just want to see real quick because in addition to pre-k for me um, this year we're writing and doing K for me for kindergarten Um, and the same would hold true. So I didn't know if they had specific kindergarten research on here. I'm not seeing it. Um, but this Boston page has a lot of great resources and a lot of strong connections to pre-K for me. So I would definitely recommend it for folks or administrators um, that are looking for more specific um, guidance or reasons behind it. Nicole, while you're in there, can you throw the link for that onto the chat room? For this Boston? Yep. Sure can. Thank you. Um, so while you're doing that, I have a couple of questions in the chat room also. Um, whoops, somebody else just, thank you. Um, Marcy was wondering um, about assessments. So she, uh, okay, I'm assuming they're using the creative curriculum, which, you, which they're also utilizing <laughs> teaching strategy gold to track progress. Um, it also lets the teachers develop a report card that's not based on like regular regular report cards based on 
Um, and so I was about to answer that, but you can still utilize your same assessment tool for TSG. Um, and actually, if you're, I know there's there's a crosswalk with OWL. I'm sure there's one with cre a creative curriculum. Um, I don't think there's one for pre-K for me at this point, but it's all very similar, but the assessment tool can remain the same. If yes. I'm Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so whatever assessment tool you're already using, for example, Gold or Core, um, can be used in, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Alignment, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, with Pre-K for Me. Boston Public Schools has their own assessment and their own report cards. You'll see down here. Oh, I started somewhere. Three, four, five, six. Maybe I saw it on the kindergarten page. But if you fish around on the page, oh, right here, assessments. Um, and I would, I would recommend or um, be fine if teachers were accessing the Boston's assessment as well um, instead of, you know, a different one. But um, you'll notice that the bigger picture being whatever assessment tool you're using in this curriculum or any curriculum um, should be whole child and um, formative in nature versus just looking at math and ELA standards um, and potentially being one-on-one. -on -one. So it's really common for teachers to utilize those summative assessments throughout the school year, which they have a place, you know, sometimes you have to interact one-on-one -on -one in the hallway with the student to gain information of what they know um, but we're really wanting teachers to um, use that time during centers, use that time during whole group and small groups to interact and observe students and track their growth that way. So Boston's would align with that, um, that theory as well. And then back on our main web page, um, there's some additional math resources. So if the math activities are ones that you're looking to implement with the curriculum, then those tools are there. Again, um, written in contract with one of your uh, fellow teachers. So she, I know she'd be more than happy to help you understand or decipher anything that comes up for you in the math pieces. Same as technology. So the technology um, supplements are just that. There are ways that you could incorporate, highlight, and enhance technology in your classroom. Some teachers aren't ready for that yet, and that's totally fine. It's here if you are, um, but certainly not something that you would have to do every day. Okay, so I'm just going to pop into one of the units real quick. So you'll see that they're all here with a visual aid, so unit one family, and then into friends, wind and water. World of Color, and if my page was accurate, it would be Unit 5, Shadows and Reflections, and then Unit 6, Things That Grow. So these are all likely topics that you're already doing um, in more or less the similar format, right? I don't know many teachers that don't start the school year focusing on family, friends, community, um, community helpers, community workers, things like that. So that's all written within these first two units. So this shouldn't feel um, awkward or uncomfortable for many of you, because I'm confident in saying that you're already doing much of this. So when you click on the visual picture, oops, anyway, um, unit one family, it's gonna bring you to this page. So here's an overview of just unit one. This is really great to, uh, obviously for the teachers, but is also for administrators. So if they're wondering um, sort of why you're doing family, um, what concepts you're covering, what are your goals with this unit, it's done for you. Don't have to recreate that for anybody. So these are the focuses of unit one. I'm not gonna, you guys can read and you can access this later, so I'm not gonna waste your time reading it for you. Um, the other pieces there are some folks I know like to have these printed out and access it that way versus online like this. So if you wanted to print the entire unit, there's a link for that here. The caveat to that is that it's huge and it really can't be printed um, front and back because some of the resources in there are color resources that if you print them back to back on regular paper that we have, um, it's gonna bleed and not look right and not be as high quality if you would have just done it um, on one page. So you can see it's taking a little while to load and, 
because like I say, it's a huge document. But this gives you everything for unit one um, in one big booklet. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna make you sit here for that That's there. Um, and then language support. So this is something that many teachers use. You don't have to, it's just here as a resource. And they'll post these within their centers. So I'll show you what I mean once it opens up. Um, so for example, in the library and listening area, um, a teacher might print this, come on might print this and just have it posted on the wall or posted somewhere that another adult could access it. So its intent is that when an adult is in the center interacting with students, they can recall what the intent of that center was or is for that child. So for example, unit one, week one in library and listening, there's gonna be books about caring for babies. There's gonna be other books too, of course, not just this, however, um, the intent being that there are specific books around caring for babies and as the adult you're going to want to call out these specific naming words, um, per perhaps these action words, these describing words. So this is just a guide in the center. It's great for assistant teachers. It's great for substitutes. It's great if you have a visitor come in um, or your administration come in and they say, hey, I'm going to go sit in the library area um, with a couple students. And you could show them, oh great, here's um, just a quick guide you could use to guide your interaction um, and to keep your conversation on topic. So just um, an option for folks. And there should be one for pretty much every center. And then there's those. So here we go into the week by week access. So unit one family, at the top of every one of these links, is all of the um, information you need for, remember, Swipple, songs, wordplay, letters, and numbers. Some folks call it Swiplin. So I'll show you those. But then more importantly, here's your daily schedule. So if you're a full day classroom, you're gonna click on the full day link, and this is done for you. Done and done. So day one, which is potentially a Monday, you're gonna do your first read aloud with Crybaby, and then your intro to centers are going to really focus on um, paintings inspired by Crybaby and paper collages. Um, and you'll model some other centers at, as well, but these are two are highlighted here. The art studio and the easel. Sounds like the same thing, but they're different. Certainly your easel is going to be near your art studio, most likely, because materials are similar. Um, but there's, you'll see in many of the weeks they're different. So at the art studio, at a table, you'll have materials for paper collages, but at the easel, you're gonna have specific materials for paintings inspired by Crybaby. And I'm gonna show you those lesson plans in just a minute. And then you'll notice as the week goes on, some of them say continue, continue, continue. That just means you're doing what was happening the day before. So paper collages is gonna to be an art studio option on day one, two, and three. On day four, you're going to introduce and swap out materials for printing with objects and continue that on day five. So many of you, this will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Some of you, it might be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday. You know, it just depends on what your individual programming is. And it has every center there. If it's left blank, so for example, um, day one in blocks is blank, that's just the teacher's choice. So you're just going to let... Uh, um, supply the blocks and allow the students to manipulate and experience the blocks without any real intent or guidance behind what they could build, what they uh, might think about connecting to the story, etc. Um, it's going to be more of a free play for them in blocks as well as puzzles and manipulatives on this day. Um, you'll notice in week one there's no thinking and feedback. Okay, does that make sense? And similarly, in the half day schedule, or it's labeled part day, you'll see it's just a little shorter. So same read alouds, same intro to centers, and then um, your centers activities. And then if you happen to do um, Swipple that day, or if you happen to do Let's Find Out About It that day, whatever um, 
you've decided to schedule it out. So you'll you'll remember that on that on week one at the easel, it was paintings inspired by Crybaby. So here's the lesson plan for that. So it tells you exactly what you need for materials, some of the focused vocabulary that you're going to use, like illustrate or illustrator, author, depict. That's a big word for the first day of pre-K. Well, first few weeks of pre-K. Um, and then it's gonna tell you, it does give you some model um, expressions that you can use. Some teachers like having it scripted this way, some do not. The point being, this is like in general how you could be or should be um, introducing it to the students. Okay, so the lesson plans are done for you as well. Again, if administrators are saying, hey, can you give me um, your uh, week plans or your lesson plan for um, whole group tomorrow? Sure can, in seconds. Okay, and then also there's some inspiration here for that crybaby easel activity. Oh, it didn't actually pull up what I thought it was gonna pull up. Okay, check that. Other ones you'll notice throughout the lesson plan pages, it'll say resource. For example, right here on day four in blocks, the activity in the lesson plan is building homes with windows. And you might provide this visual aid to show students the different types of homes and the different types of windows. Okay, and these are homes that they are likely familiar with in our state. These are not the same visual aids that they're using in Boston, right? So this is one example of where some of those changes came in. So manipulating these links and getting used to this um, is definitely gonna take some time. One thing we always tell teachers is to be kind to yourselves, please. I always say that, it's like my go-to saying. You're human, the students are not gonna crumble up and turn into mud if something goes wrong in a lesson or if you weren't didn't have time to implement a specific lesson plan um, these curriculum this one and all others take time to really get comfortable with and to really learn the ins and outs of navigating it so and when i say it takes time i mean it takes years um, year one year two are probably gonna feel very unsettling you're you might not be convinced that it's working you might not be comfortable navigating it um, and that's okay my biggest advice is don't give up on it just keep trucking along um, so i know some of the teachers um signed in here are already using this does anybody feel comfortable chiming in with your experience so far with this in your classrooms that was a lot of information that i dumped on you Oh, I'll chime in, I guess. I feel badly no one's saying anything. Deb, you're back. Thank you. I'm back. You're welcome. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Um, it was intimidating, I think, the first year because um, the curriculum was not tweaked for the state of Maine. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you showed the children were, was the photos from Boston. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that because they have to get exposed to what a city is, but um, I really, I, this second year is so much, gets a little easier, mm -hmm. and now we've been thrown this monkey wrench. So I'm excited for the third year, to, you know, as it gets a, a little easier, but I agree, don't give up, keep plugging along, you'll make mistakes and you can't beat yourself up over it. Um, you can still read, I, when Nicole mentioned like, um, not giving up on books that you love. Um, don't do that. Um, we took at Halloween, my group, we took the little old lady who's not afraid of anything, which I love that story. And we made it an outdoor component. We, I went to Goodwill, I bought the green pants, I got the white shirt, we got all the components and we hid them in the woods out behind our school and the kids we took the book and the kids had to find them in that order of the story that's so awesome. 
you Great can idea. you can you can take what you love and make it fit in on that fifth week. Perfect. Thank you, Deb. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop sharing so I can see the chat box a little better. Oh, Erin, you're here too. Yeah, this is your first year. Did you have anything to add? <laughs> I'll call you out on it. Um, I felt a little overwhelmed my first year, um, just getting everything printed with the images and um, laminating everything, so you, using the same language that the curriculum was um, mentioning to use for the vocabulary for students. Um, what else? There's a lot of transitions, I feel, in the day, um, so it's just really uh, coming up with a way to plan and get the students to engage in all of those transitions. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's really all I could say for my first year. Yeah. Yeah, it's a work in progress. And it's a work in progress for us at the department too. I mean, just because um, the links and the activities that are posted now, that doesn't mean that they won't be edited and changed as more classrooms are implementing this and more feedback comes in around um, you know, things that are working well and things that maybe aren't, right? So we're definitely open and wanting to have that feedback um, given to us so that we can, everything is editable. Um, so there were a few questions too in the chat box around the K for me curriculum. So that's being piloted right now, up until a few weeks ago. Um, and the intent was that it would be uh, uploaded this summer and then free and available next year for kindergarten programs. Um, so as far as I know, that's still the plan. I, d I haven't heard anything changing in that aspect. Um, kindergarten has four units um, instead of six, and so they're a little longer. In pre-K for me, each unit is about four to five weeks-ish, depending on your program hours and um, scheduling. In K for me, they're uh, a little longer, like six to seven weeks. They get a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more into the content. Um, but still, the read-alouds and centers are still alive and well in kindergarten as well. Um, Boston's website uh, is focused on K-2. That's what they call kindergarten there. And that's a pretty good, um, gives you a pretty good idea of what it'll look like. Because similarly, ours um, took that and, and tweaked it and edited it. So I know one of my favorite parts of the kindergarten for me curriculum is um, when they do a family night and they can't think of the title. There's a specific name for it. But it's uh, basically an evening event where they invite the families in to tour the classroom. And it can look different. I mean, teachers have some flexibility in how that's uh, organized. But, um, and they, it's a showcase, a family showcase. And the students set up and explain and show throughout the classroom what they've been working on. And it's really, really, really um, incredible. I can talk about that real quickly, the showcase of learning yes. in pre-K. Um, we, we did, the, we, thank goodness we fit ours in right before this all came down. Um, we tied ours to our music concert. Um, I think I'm the only one in the district, I don't know, June, correct me if I'm wrong, that got their showcase of learning in and got their, the music concert in before we were out. But um, you, were, you are the rock star. <laughs> <laughs> that's right I'm the rock star <laughs> of RSU 57 yeah, that's right. um, thanks um, but just so parents didn't have to go out two nights in a row or two afternoons it just seemed the logical thing to do and it was such a big success each kid had a poster of their own work we had all sorts of all the centers were open for the parents to experience um, and it was over in like 45 minutes. I mean, the kids, the kids did it all. I didn't have to do anything other than they're like, wow, this is amazing. We didn't know how much they were doing in class. Yeah. I guess it was the big con comment that I got from parents. I mean, we send home a lot of stuff, but they're like, this is amazing. Yeah. So that was pretty awesome. I love the showcase of learning. So I have, I'm just trying to pull up some pictures um, really quickly. And while that loads, I think that there was another. So yes, Tammy, good question. So the other 
from here on out into next week, I'll continue to have the pre-K open office hours, which are scheduled and blasted out through the DOE newsroom every night. And the open office hours is just open conversation, no guided agenda or specific topic. In addition to that, I'll also be hosting these one hour focus discussions. So today's was on just navigating the website, which you'll receive a one hour certificate for. I'm going to give you that link. And then next week, you can write this down if you want to. You don't have to, though, because it will be um, on the schedule that DOE puts out every night. But they're all going to be from 9 to 10. So starting Monday, April 6th, will be read-alouds for this curriculum. Wednesday, April 8th, will be intro to centers and centers. Friday, April 10th, will be Swipple and Math. And then moving into the following week, Tuesday, April 14th, will be Thinking and Feedback as well as Small Group. And Thursday, April 16th, will be Classroom Environments, which will be more of a general classroom environments, but certainly um, highlighted to Pre-K for me as well. And those will all offer individual one hour contact hour certificates. And they will be recorded and posted online. So if you can't make one of them, um, you can always come back. But like I said in the beginning, you don't get a certificate for watching the recording, um, just if you were here live. All right, before I give you that, let me just see if the pictures popped up real quick. I wanted to show you of what um, one of the family showcase nights were about. For my first year, Nicole, I did not do the showcase of learning. Is yeah. that is that okay? I mean, I, yes. I just no, yeah, just that's exactly the what we mean. first. Okay, yeah. that's exactly what we mean by be kind to yourself, right? Like, don't feel like you need to take on every single nook and cranny of this curriculum in year one. Um, you've really got to sort of get your feet wet and get comfortable um, before you dive in and feel confident doing everything and doing everything like really well, right? Um, let's see. Okay, let's see. So full disclosure, this is just my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Here. So this is um, a local kindergarten classroom that is doing kindergarten for me. And these are some pictures from their uh, family showcase. So it'll give you an idea of um, what students are do learning. Um, and this was only in January. So look at some of this writing. This was their estuary. Um, and they talk about their salmon, their salmon eggs. Their salmon eggs are pink. Salmon, um, does it say fry? Are silver? Is that like what a? So that must be like what um, a salmon becomes from eggs into a fry. Oh, my husband's standing here and he's going, "Yes, Nicole, it's a fry." <laughs> um, and then into a par. So that's interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, this was um, a photo of one student's wolf that he made out of blocks. This is another wolf. I mean, like crazy, right? These are five and six year olds. Um, this is another display that they helped to make. Um, looks like the life cycle. It, it, the bigger concept being around amphibians and this specifically, of course, is frogs. Oh, okay, that's not what I wanted. Where is... Um, and then... These were some of their other highlights from that evening. See all the families moving through the classroom. Some of the books they've been reading. Water table doesn't have to have water or sand in it. It can be used for other materials as well. Some of their books that they've put together. So just an idea to give you... Um, some like brain work with that. So it's just about 11. Let me put in, 
Oh, those pictures are just posted on my Facebook page. Um, they were from the Helen Thompson Elementary School. I'm not sure, honestly, if it's an open site or uh, if you have to be invited in. I happen to be um, have a child that attends there. Uh, how many main pre-K programs are now working with pre-K? So I believe there's about 17, give or take a couple classrooms. Um, and so that's across about five or six districts. Um, throughout the state that are using pre-k for me to my knowledge okay so let me go ahead and give you the link to that certificate and I'll stay on and keep this going to make sure everybody is able to click on it so you can either cut and copy that link into your web browser or just click directly from the chat box it should bring you to a quick survey and then you'll get your certificate my email once again in case you have any trouble with that okay so any last questions folks have if not you're welcome to go to that certificate and you should be all set thank you <laughs>